Greetings, Hillside family and friends. Good to get together today as we come and sit around God's Word and see what His Holy Spirit has to say to His church. Such a wonderful reassurance to know that we've got the wisdom of ages right here in, in His Word, right here in His very will for our lives. And so as we gather here today as friends and family, we gather here knit together by the Spirit of Christ. And so it's in that name that I greet you as we come together we share around his word lots of things been happening we've had developments we've had changes in the lockdown status uh, we're looking forward to go to lockdown level one very shortly and i'm sure that that will impact our ability to get together and worship uh, quite a bit more we look forward to reopening our church one of these days shortly again man we're so excited to get together the fellowship of the saints you know we can share the word it's wonderful to share the word over social media, but nothing, no nothing, can replace fellowship. It's very important. It's one of the pillars of the church. Always has been since the church's inception in the New Testament and still is to this day. So for those of our hillside friends uh, that don't belong to the local church here, but you're looking forward to the opening of your local church, man, God bless you. I speak every blessing upon you. I speak a blessing upon your fellowship. I speak a blessing upon your gathering. I speak a blessing upon your leaders and leadership. I just pray that you're going to go into a new season. I pray you're going to go into a season of abundance and joy. Time is short. Our Lord is coming shortly. I, I, I feel it very, very strongly within me. You know, if we just look around us, we, we can see. And, and, and our hearts cry as a church is, Come, Lord Jesus come like he said when you see these things happening lift your head so we're not running away we're not scared of this we lift our head because we look to the skies and we know that any day shortly we'll be seeing our jesus come for his church in that wonderful event that uh, we call the doctrine of the rapture so what i'm saying is if the lord's going to come shortly let's make the most of the time that we have left you know it could be a week uh, could be a day, could be a year, could be 10 years. Even if it's another 50 years away, I, I tell you, you speak to some of the older folks, they tell you, those that have lived 50, 70, 80 years, they tell you it's so quick. Time goes so quickly. Let's make the most of the time that God has given unto us as we await His return. This morning, I'm going to look at something uh, in, in God's Word. And you remember last week, when we spoke about limping but blessed, we spoke about uh, Jacob and how he uh, wrestled with the angel of the Lord or with God himself and, and the lessons that we got from his crossing of the Jabbok River. But not every battle, not every wrestling match is against God. What happens when the enemy picks a fight with you? I mean, you're, you're just going through your daily life. You're doing the best you can. You, you, you're having times of rewards, but you're also having times of challenges as well. But there's a difference between a challenge in life and when the enemy actually picks a fight with you. And not every battle that you have, not every wrestling match is against God. This is what I'm trying to show you. And you need to be able to discern when something is with God, when something is against yourself, your own inner being, your own flesh, when you're fighting against the enemy. He's come to pick a fight. He loves picking fights. He loves picking fights. And we need to know how to distinguish this because that's going to show us our warfare. It's going to show us how to meet the enemy. We don't want to run away from him. We don't want to run away from him. We want to meet him because we're not going to give up any territory. So this morning, we're going to turn to God's word in the second book of Chronicles. That's two Chronicles, chapter 32. I'm going to be speaking an incident in the life of one of the kings of Israel and his name was Hezekiah and there was a time that the enemy came and picked a fight with him let's read and then we're going to get into breaking this word down and just getting into it and seeing the substance of it and how we can apply it to our lives if you have your Bible in front of you even if your translation is different I read from the ESV but even if your translation is different I want to encourage you read along read along uh, you know if you see a slight nuance or a different word yeah or a different word used there than what the ESV uses there might be a reason 
God might be showing you something that he hasn't shown me. And then you can go and bless somebody in return with it. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Let's read. After these things and these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem, he planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? He set to work resolutely, and built up all the wall that was broken down, and raised towers upon it. And outside it he built another wall, and he strengthened the Milo in the city of David. He also made weapons and shields in abundance, and he set combat commanders over the people, and gathered them together to him in the square at the gate of the city, and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him. For there are more with us than there are with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Wow! Hezekiah comes and demonstrates to us how it is that we should tackle the enemy. But you notice how this portion of scripture started off. It started off saying, after these things. Well, after what things? Well, we need to get back to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 29th, the 29th chapter of this book, because that starts showing us uh, where Hezekiah started his reign. You know, he was a young man when he took over the throne. He was 25 years old. That's very young. That's very immature. Man, I remember before I hit my 21st birthday, I thought, yo, when I'm 21, then I've made it. Then I'm a man, boy. Gosh, man, you know, you know, the older you get, the more you realize you still have to learn. Then when I hit 30, I thought, well, I've, surely I've got to be 30. But then you realize when you're 30 years old, when you grow a little bit older, you find out that the older men and women still see a 30-year-old as being very tender and very young with much to learn. In fact, I passed 30 years old many years ago and still I realize I've got so much to learn. But here was Hezekiah, 25 years old, takes over the throne. I mean, that must have been a daunting task. The throne at that stage was very corrupt. I mean, Israel had gone through a place and Judah, by now uh, Israel and Judah had split. There was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin. So, so Hezekiah was the king over the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom was known as Israel, or they were called Israel, the, of the other ten tribes of Israel. But the southern kingdom was now called Judah, and that's where the Jews started being called Jews. It comes from the word Judah. Uh, you know, before Judah, they were all called Israelites. They all got their name. Remember, God renamed Jacob Israel, and so they were all called Israelites. Before they were called Israelites, they were all called Hebrews. That's just a bit of history for you. So they were first called Hebrews, then they were all called Israelites, and then with the split, the northern kingdom were called Israelites or Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah, from which we get the name the Jews. And, and, and Hezekiah was the king over the southern kingdom. 25 years old when he became the king. There had been a long succession, both in the nor northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There were... Uh, very uh, wicked kings and you'd have a couple of wicked kings uh, uh, generation after generation every now and then you'd have a good king that would come a, uh, come along and then a wicked king would come along and just undo all the good work and the grace and the favor that God poured upon the, the people because of the good work of the good king isn't it so sad when when generations of good work can get undone by one corrupt official by, by, by one sinful, wicked man. 
Well, these kingdoms had fallen into so much sin. In fact, Hezekiah's father, Asa, was a great sinner. He was a wicked man, did much evil before the Lord. In fact, he was the one that wanted to make all sorts of treaties with uh, Syria and Assyria and places like that as well. He, he, he went to Assyria and he checked out the altars of Assyria. And then he came back into God's kingdom and he wanted to copy an altar of Assyria in God's temple. Isn't that wicked? God gave a pattern. He didn't want any pagan influence coming into his worship. He didn't want any pagan influence doing things the way the pagans do things. I believe this is a wonderful word for the church today as well. We need to know that as a church we must be distinct in the way that we worship God. If we look around at the way unbelievers do things or the way other people worship their gods, we've got to say, no, listen, God has shown us. He said, I have shown you, O man, what is good. We've got to know that God has shown His church what is good. And we've got to shun the pagan ways of the world around us. The Bible says, come out from her, my people. And so we need to come out from her and we need to worship God, not in our way, but in the way He has prescribed that we worship. We want to worship Him in a way that brings much joy and delight to Him. So he, uh, Hezekiah's father, Asa, he was a pagan worshiper, man. He's supposed to be from the tribes. Of, he comes from a long lineage, supposed to be from the tribes of God. He, he comes from a lineage of Moses, man. And, 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 and he wasn't a Levite, but, but just coming from, from the teachings of Moses, where they had the temple, the tabernacle, a history of the miracles in the wilderness, crossing the Red Sea, mighty miracles. And yet he turned to idolatry anyway. Ach, no, man. Then what we have is when we read this, we read after these things after what things well hezekiah came in to become a king at the age of 25 not an easy thing because he came into a corrupt system his very own father had been evil and corrupt and yet hezekiah came in at that young age can you imagine how overwhelmed he must have been there must have been people within his courts that wanted to usurp the throne take advantage of his youth perhaps even do away with him because he was so young inexperienced and tender but it shows you that God had his hand upon this young king and I'm sure that God put many good counselors in his way people to protect him although there was so much wickedness within his courts I believe God put people there to protect him counsel him steer him and groom him into the position that God had for him it just goes to show you as well even though his father was wicked he was good uh, we are not, we are not contained, we are not bound to the legacies of wicked generations that have gone ahead of us. Now you may have been blessed with a good father, and, and praise God for that blessing, it truly is. But there are many people who have come from, from wicked parents, people who perhaps have abused them, people who have neglected them, people who have abandoned them. But let me tell you something, you've got a stronger bloodline. You've got a, a stronger lineage. Doesn't mean that because you share the same DNA that you're going to turn out the same. When you give your heart to Jesus, I believe in my heart of hearts on a spiritual level, your DNA changes because now you become part of the bloodline of Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean because your parents did wicked things, because your father was a sinner or an evildoer, that you need to pick it up. You're a brand new creation in Jesus Christ and you can do amazing things, amazing things for God, just like Hezekiah did amazing things. After these things, the Bible says, what things? Well, amazing things. When Hezekiah became king, he set about reforming the whole worship. You know, uh, the, the way that we read the Bible, we, we get a sense that well, the, the, the temple itself had become full of wicked things. It had almost become a storage house. You know, they were, they were storing old things in there and pagan things in there. It was disused. The doors were broken. Uh, the, the worship was neglected. The priests weren't even there. So Hezekiah as a king. Now get this. He was supposed to be a secular king, but he took upon himself a spiritual mantle. Oh God, for the day that we get a leader over this country, although he's a secular king, that he takes upon himself a spiritual mantle, that he takes upon himself a passion for the house of God, a, a, a desire to see godly worship stirred up properly in God's way again. 
he started clearing out the temple he called together to himself the Levites and the priests and he said to them well now I want you guys to go and clear out that temple go and read about it, it took them about 16 days to clear all the nonsense out and then they came to him and they said it is done and then he started putting back into place the worship the sanctification and the consecration of the priest in fact there weren't enough of the priests of the line of Aaron so he allowed some of the other Levites to take over some of the duties of the Aaronic priests just so that he could get the work done properly and God made an allowance for that as well you see God sees the heart of people God sees the heart of people and there are times where we've got to say oh God oh Lord just bless this oh Lord just help me I don't have enough people but oh God help me can, can you imagine how many pagans and idolaters Hezekiah must have upset with all these reforms because where, where the, the worship falls into disarray then a government can be corrupted and when a government can be corrupted people can become enriched and so it's these wicked people that enjoy corruption that love to see the house of God in disarray we need a generation of people that say so far and no further we, we are here to worship our God and God's house will be our priority we've only one life to live until we go to meet our maker and be with him for eternity oh let our story be that God's house was our passion that God's worship was our passion that that ministering unto the Lord and fulfilling the ministry for which he designed and called us was our passion that was our number one priority in life God's raising up people like that I believe God is raising up people like that I believe that a lot of churches are going to have to start scrapping a lot of the things that they were getting distracted with they're going to have to go back to the fundamentals they're going to have to go back to the basic groups uh, roots yes okay so they've got to get rid of some of the the, the, the the bells and the whistles they've got to get rid of some of the glitz and the glamour but you know I remember one of the commands that God gave to uh, Moses was he said when you build my altar you mustn't use cut stones you must use natural stones the way that I made them and I believe that in the house of God as we are preparing to be the spotless bride of Christ's return we're gonna have to get rid of a lot of those cut stones those man-made things we've got to get rid of it and we've got to use the stones that God has put and we've got to use them the way God has formed them maybe they don't make sense to our eye but listen to me again it's not what, what is about beautiful or right to you and me it's about what God requires it's what what is beautiful to him and oh I believe that was the heart of Hezekiah he set about after these things he set about reforming he was a great reformer must have been a very very brave man and his devotion the way that he ruled over his people I believe that he he had an understanding he said oh God I believe if I'm to rule over your people then Lord I need to serve you if I'm to serve them properly I need to serve you first this is a fundamental principle in serving people if you're going to be devoted to anybody if you're going to be devoted to a congregation if you're going to be devoted to an office and an office space if you're going to be devoted to your family as a devoted parent or if you're going to devote yourself to your parents as a child uh, if you're going to devote yourself to any kind of a cause listen to me carefully you first need to be devoted to God seek his heart seek his heart and then you'll be able to serve in the capacity that he requires of you so what we have here is Hezekiah was a revolutionary he came and he stripped away all that political correctness he came and he stripped away all the ivory towers that had been built over the generations all those things that were in those channels were in which corruption could flow so easily he stripped all those things away he was a revolutionary in the house of God and he came and he brought all those wonderful reforms because of his devotion to God and yet we're told after these things and these acts of faithfulness so Nacarib the king of Assyria came and invaded do you see what's happened over here I, I, I mean he had there were some other evil kings and they never had to face a Sennacherib and so 
what many of us would say if we were speaking from a fleshly perspective is, Oh God, but I've done so much for you. Lord, look at what the things that I've just accomplished. I've gotten rid of all the corruption. I've cleaned out the temple. I, I, I've reformed the worship of the priesthood. And Lord, look, now here comes Sennacherib. Oh God, what have I done to upset you? You know, that kind of, come on. We, we sometimes get that kind of mindset. And we think that when the enemy attacks, it must be because we've done something wrong. Listen to me very carefully. Sometimes the enemy attacks not because you've done anything wrong, but because you're doing everything right. You're doing things well. It's not because you're displeasing to God, but because you're pleasing Him. And the enemy knows, boy, if you keep on this road, there are blessings waiting for you. If you keep on this road, uh, there is honor waiting for you. We carry on reading a little bit further in the life of Hezekiah. It said he became exceedingly wealthy, exceedingly powerful, exceedingly honored, uh, honored among the, not only his own people, but people around. He had a reputation. Why? Because he honored God first. The enemy knows that there's joy on that path. He knows that there's honor on that path. He knows that there's reconciliation. He knows there's peace. He knows there's prosperity on that path. And oh boy, he wants nothing of it. He doesn't want you to have anything of it. So he comes and he throws everything at you that he can. He wants to dislodge you from that path. How sad it would have been if Hezekiah threw his arms in the air. said, oh, well, Lord, I've done so much for you. And yet you let Hezekiah, a Sennacherib, come against me. Well, God, if you're going to let me be attacked, then what's the point in serving you? How many of us have fallen into that very trap and we've sabotaged the blessing that lay ahead of us? If that's been you, I want to encourage you. Get back on the path. Get back on the path. Don't miss out on what God has for you. Don't let anybody, don't let any Sennacherib, don't let any uh, devil come and rob you of what God's got from you. That's what I want to say to you. Just, just like Jacob held on to, to that angel and held on to God and, and, and said to God, he said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. If you're under, uh, going through attack and you know that this is not just a wrestling with God, I, I want you to hold on to God anyway. Hold on to him and say, oh Lord, this fire is fierce. Oh Lord, this enemy is throwing everything at me that he can. But God, this one thing I do, I hold on. I hold on. I hold on to you, Lord. I will follow you. In fact, this is what I want to encourage you. When the enemy attacks you, you've got to ask yourself, why? Why is he attacking me? What's in it for him? You, you need to know what's in it for him. He's got a reason why he attacks you. Uh, you know, it, it's not just to cut off your blessing, although that's a big part of it. He wants you to start serving Him. He wants you to be discouraged. And so you say, well, yeah, I don't serve the devil. Listen, when you give yourself up to dis uh, discouragement, when you give yourself up to negativity, you may not be bowing in front of an idol, but you know what? You've lost your effectiveness for God because you've taken your eyes off of Him. And the enemy is going, oh, yes, go, my Sennacherib. You've done well by dislodging that person. I want to encourage you, get back on the path. Ask yourself what it is that the enemy has got in mind. I've learned, I've learned that when the enemy attacks me in one area, take a step back and ask yourself, why is it that he's attacked me here? Why is it that he's attacked you in your finances? Why is it that all of a sudden you're retrenched? That business that was going so well before coronavirus hit, why is it that now you're having to shut the doors? Why is it that so many staff members have had to be laid off? Why is it that you've been hit with this sickness in your body? Ask yourself. Because the, the enemy is very strategic. He's going to attack you in an area that he knows where blessing lies. If he attacks you in your finances, you know why that is? Because that is an opportunity for you to prove your faithfulness in the area of finances so that God can bless you with more. If he attacks you in your area of health, you know why that is? So that you can prove yourself faithful in your health. Oh boy, I'm not feeling well today. I, I, I really, since I woke up this morning, I've just been feeling weak and I'm in pain and I'm 
But you know what? I'm going to praise God anyway. You know what? As tough as I'm feeling, as bad as I'm feeling, I know that there are some people out there that need me. So I'm going to swing my legs off of this bed this morning and I'm going to go and serve those people in Jesus' name. It's amazing how many times I've heard people sharing testimonies that they've done just that. And while they did that, their health came back to them and they started feeling better. Even in times of great lack, they served God with their finances. They were faithful in their tithing. They were faithful in their generosity to, pe to people even though they had very little. They were seeking whom they could bless. You know what they did? The enemy tried to attack them there by shutting off the system, by shutting off uh, the source. But they were faithful anyway. You know what happens? Those, that, 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 that tap just bursts open and the blessing has come because you've proven faithful in that area. Now, Hezekiah was very wise in the way that he met with this challenge. Do you no notice that Hezekiah didn't just sit back fold his arms and say oh god yeah comes an attack against me oh lord you take care of the enemy there are times that god will say to you you know what step back i got this you have to do nothing the battle's not yours the battle's the lord the lord's there are times that god will say that but there are also times where god says to you i have resourced you i have equipped you i've trained you now go get victory god will do that to you and so we have this where, 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 where Hezekiah said, Lord, I see that this is happening. I'm going to start planning for it. Do you notice how very carefully he planned? He went and he made uh, they, they, uh, swords, uh, spears and, and, and swords and shields he went and made. He, he, he built up the walls. He built up the milo, which was some sort of a rampart of sorts, a fortification. But, but look at what he did. The one thing that stood out of this to me was he cut off all the water supply to the enemy. What a wise thing to do. You know, if the enemy is going to come against you and set a siege against you, the same needs that he's cutting off for you, he also has those needs. So if you have water, what is a siege designed to do? It's designed to starve you out. If you need water, if you need food, listen, he also needs water. He also needs food. Now, when I speak about the devil, we understand he's a spiritual being, but he also has need. Can I tell you what his need is? His, his compulsion is to be worshipped. His compulsion is to separate the worshippers of the true God from them. That's, uh, that's second prize for him. First prize is if he can get those worshippers to worship him as well. That's his need. Don't feed his need. Cut off his supply. Hezekiah and sought counsel from his counselors and together they came up with a way to go and stop up all the wells notice hezekiah didn't go to his counselors and say well i don't know what to do what do you guys think i should do that's not what counseling is all about listen to me if, if you don't know what to do what should we do what should we do you're not listening from god li listening uh, to god you, and you're not listening for god's will hezekiah knew on his heart what he needed to do but with this plan he went to his counselors and said, Right, boys, this is what the Lord has put on my heart. How are we going to go about it? I think it's very wise, even in Christian leadership as well, for pastors of churches. You need to be very careful. You are called to lead the church. The leadership is yours. I'm not saying that you're the boss. Jesus alone is the boss. Difference between leading and being a boss. You're not a boss. You're not a Napoleon. You're a leader. And as a leader, you need to have clear-cut direction. Because if you don't know where to go, Lord, help that church. And where do you get your strategy? Not from council. You do not get your strategy by saying, Oh, well, what do you think? What do you think? What? Okay, let's take a vote. No. You get your strategy from God, from God alone. You get your strategy not at the boardroom table. You get your stra the strategy on your knees, in prayer, in quiet time, in devotion, in reading the Word of God in meditation on the things of God, in being still in front of God. That's where you get your strategy. Then when you have your strategy, then you take your strategy to the counselors and you say, the Lord has laid on my heart what to do. This is what we're going to do. How do we go about it? And so he sought some counsel and they helped him stop up all the water supply. And uh, you know, Hezekiah's tunnel is still there to this very day. They cut through solid rock 
to ensure that although all the springs and the water sources outside the city and around the area were cut off and blocked up, they had free-flowing water. Free-flowing water in their own city. How wise is that? Here's the thing I want to tell you. You need to cut off the enemy's supply. Don't give him joy of victory. If the enemy knows that a certain attack in your life is going to satisfy him, he's going to hit you there in the same area time and time again. If the enemy knows that if he attacks you, let's say in your finances, and that causes a separation between you and God, if that upsets your worship life, if that derails you, you've just shown him what it takes to stop you from serving God. On the other hand, if the enemy attacks you in your finances and you start worshipping God even harder, right? If the enemy attacks you in your supply and it just, man, you just lean on God's faithfulness all the more. You start calling in those promises. You start rejoicing to God. The, the high praises of God upon your lips. Do you honestly think that the enemy is going to keep attacking you in your finances if he sees that it's not drawing you apart from God, it's shoving you closer to God? No, man. He's not going to attack you. He's going to say, whoa, 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 hold on one second. Right? That's what I'm saying. Cut off the enemy's supply. Ask yourself, why is it that he's attacking me? What is it that God has possibly got in the future for me? So I'm lo I love to see that. Hezekiah, very spiritual man very spiritual man because we see that he came and he set in order all the temple worship that was his priority that was his foundation that's where he started from but he was also a very very practical man as well when he saw the enemy coming didn't just fold his arms he said right let's spring into action what do we need to do where do we need to strengthen ourselves uh, what weaponry do we need and he got shields and he got arrows and he built up the wall. You, you notice something about that weaponry that he uses. Shields and arrows. You're only going to need a shield or an arrow or a sword or something for close combat if somebody gets through your walls. If your walls are standing strong, you won't need those shields. Right? This is what I'm saying to our, our dear Christian brothers and sisters. Make sure your walls are strong. We, we, we have become duped into letting all sorts of nonsense across our walls. I, they, they, I want to tell you, man, you, you need to build those walls up again. Come into this place where you declare right to be right and wrong to be wrong. You, you need to be in, in a position where when people start invading your walls, that you can defend those walls and say, excuse me, I don't believe in what you're talking about. I don't buy your product. Back off. Excuse me to the enemy. I, I don't accept this attack. Pray into that area. God, I speak. This person has just wanted to come and attack me now because I have said and I've declared that I believe in the one true God. Now this person is all offended at me. and the, No, you believe in the one true God and you serve him and serve him only. Build up that wall. Lord, there was this person at university that came with this talk about evolution and all that. And I took a bit of a crumble over here. But Lord, I declare, I declare that you are the one creator God. Not millions and billions of years. You said, let there be and it was. Let's build up those walls. Oh God, the church has had to bow. And uh, it's not, not had to bow, let me correct that. The church has bowed to so much political correctness. We're so afraid to call light, light, and dark, dark, because we don't want to offend anybody, that our walls have been crumbling. And all of a sudden, what used to be the pure and spotless bride of Christ resembles another worldly organization. No, we need to build those walls again. The church is meant to be a pillar of the truth. And yes, the word of God says, this is where we got it very wrong in the past, dear saints. We, we, we were called to call, uh, speak the truth, but speak it in love. I've seen many tr churches that have spoken the truth, but in hate. Yes, those that have spoken the truth in hate, they should be had up for hate speech because that's exactly what it is in hate. But you can take that same truth and speak that truth with the Spirit of Christ and speak that truth in love that can affect a change in the era. Don't forget, you don't hate the person, man. 
You hate the spirit that is controlling that person. You hate the dark force under which that person is. You need to speak life into that person, love and encouragement in that person, that they can also be translated from the uh, domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. So what happens when trouble comes and picks a fight with you because of all the good that you've done? Well, firstly, you need to get people around you to pray. Get your leadership. Get your leadership. If you're not in a situation where you're in a position with leadership, send me an email. I would love to come in agreement with prayer. If you feel lonely in your spiritual walk, get in touch with me, man. Send me an email. I will come in agreement with prayer. Our email address uh, should be right there. Get in touch. Don't do it alone. Because, you know, just like the wolf likes to separate that one lone sheep from the, from the, the flock, then that sheep becomes very vulnerable. If you're alone, if you're telling yourself, no, I can get through this, just take some time, you're on very shaky ground. Get people around you. Hezekiah got his direction from the Lord, but he also got his counselors around him as well. And I'm sure that by this stage of Hezekiah's rule, these counselors were trustworthy men because they were the men that were with him from the age of 25, steering him, leading him, showing him, protecting him, guarding him. Get those counselors. Get somebody to pray with you as well. The enemy will pick a fight. The, the, the Bible says, I remember, the Bible says, Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Isn't that true? I mean, if you're righteous, how many times have you gone through something where if your heart wasn't as tender as it was, what you're going through wouldn't have affected you as much as it's affecting you. But because you care, I mean, if you were a callous sinner and didn't care about corruption or hurt, if you didn't care about the profanity on the television, if you didn't care about the blasphemy, let me tell you, Netflix, if you're a Christian, you need to get Netflix out of your home. That's Satan in a box, man. Wicked stuff. Wicked stuff. You wouldn't care about that stuff. It hardens you. It sort of just sears your conscience, that type of stuff, constantly. But because you've got the Spirit of Christ, your afflictions increase uh, because you because you're so sensitive to these things because you've got the spirit of Christ a attacks come against you that don't normally come against the average person that only assail the righteous many are the afflictions of the righteous uh, the first thing I want you to do after you've got your counsel around you is you need to get an understanding that the affliction is not because you're a sinner if you've been walking to the best of your ability, if your relationships with people are right, you know, the Bible says, as far as it depend upon you, live in peace with all men. It doesn't say just live in peace with all men because there are often situations where, where it, 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 it doesn't depend upon you. It depends upon the other person. But, but as far as you've done, you've tried to make relationships right. and you know, Your walk with God is sincere. Service in His house is your number one priority, Right? That's a big one nowadays. Service in His house is your number one priority. Uh, your, your ministry is your, is your call in life, not your occupation or your career, your ministry. And yet you're still going through trials. You know what you can tell yourself? Well, thank Jesus that this is a confirmation. This affliction is confirmation that I am righteous in Christ Jesus because I know, I know that everything else is in order in my life and yet... I'm being attacked anyway. So uh, I understand that the devil is attacking me. He may be using a spirit of Sennacherib to do it, but I know. And do, you, do, you, do you remember how that beautiful scripture carries on? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now that's just a statement, but here's the promise. But the Lord, oh, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So, if there's a Sennacherib facing your, 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 your walls right now, if there's a Sennacherib laying siege upon you right now, I want to tell you, praise God. What is the promise of God? The Lord will deliver you out of that. It may just be a matter of time right now. God's teaching you a lesson. Sennacherib, instead of driving you away from God, he's driving you towards God, right? Because you've, you've shut off his supply. And God is getting ready to deliver you from that just a matter of time you've got to ask yourself when you get out of this attack when you get out of this and you look back on the situation you've got to say to yourself lord 
What was it that you wanted to achieve in my life? Because this situation has grown me. And if it's grown me, it means it's grown my capacity. It's grown my capacity to minister to you. And it's grown my capacity to receive from you, to steward what you have, and to bless other people as well. What area was it, Lord God, that I had to grow in in that time? Because you've delivered me out of that all. So Hezekiah took action. He planned with his officers and with his mighty men look who he got around him officers and mighty men a little bit later it speaks about the commanders when you have a siege of Sennacherib around you don't focus on Sennacherib God's going to start sending you some mighty men mighty women officers people that have been through things people that know and understand it breaks my heart there are many people in the church those pew warmers they don't know and they don't understand because they don't participate in the things of God. But people who know, oh, those officers, people who have become commanders, I'm telling you, God's going to start sending. Let me prophesy to you right now. God's going to start sending high capacity people your way. High capacity people your way. I, I'm in a time of prayer. Well, let me just share my heart with you. We, we're looking forward to the day of reopening our church again. And we're going to have to rebuild our church in many ways and in many areas. I'm trusting God to send me some high capacity people. I'm trusting God for high capacity people, no matter where they are in the world, to come and partner with us, to pray with us, to stand with us, to build something with new momentum. Those basic foundations I was talking about before. Oh God, we're looking forward to it. I believe God is going to send high capacity people our way. People that know how to pray. People that have been through a Sennacherib experience. People that understand the dynamics of ministry and how things happen. I'm calling those partners into being. But I also want to speak those people over you. I want to speak officers, mighty men and commanders coming your way. There are times, listen to me, I don't mean to be sound insensitive, but for your own preservation, there are times where you need to get rid of those negative voices. Now, those negative voices may emanate from people you love and care for. Oh, very sensitive area this. The enemy knows how to speak negative, negatively into your life because he knows how to use those that are closest to you. But there are times where you need to learn how to shut those voices out and focus on the mighty men. Uh, focus on the officers and the commanders. And those mighty men, officers and commanders may take shapes and forms that you didn't realize. They're not all going to be wealthy people, rich people, people that have got it together. Some of them may be poor, but they're going to be powerful. So some of them may seem that they have very little influence, but they're going to be powerful. They're gonna may, they may seem to have very little influence, but they're going to have great impact. Something that I've come to learn, oh boy, let me tell you, is that scripture uh, not by force or by might but by my spirit unless the lord builds a house the laborer labors in vain you can do so much in your own strength and not get anywhere but oh when god blesses when god blesses then you look around and you say wow check how these things are just coming together i didn't realize it was this easy well let me tell you it's not easy for you but it's easy for god and perhaps god has sent you through a tough season to show you it's not about how clever you are it's not about the systems you put into place not how good you are with your spreadsheets not how good you are with your little black book and planning no it's all about the blessing it's about the anointing of god unless the lord builds a house god's going to start sending those mighty men anointed men and women be very careful to 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 look out for that because God may send somebody your way and because you're so distracted by Sennacherib you don't engage with the commander that God sends your way let your focus always be on God always look to your Lord because let me tell you God knows about Sennacherib he knows about the plans of the devil God knows how how the enemy strategizes God's got all that God, God's not intimidated. God's not thrown by that. God's not affected by that. So many times, though, we start taking our eyes off of God. 
keep your eyes on God keep your focus on the temple worship when the temple worship listen to me now we are the temple of God but we don't worship this temple right we worship him and we worship him alone but I believe that God is speaking to the church and he's speaking to the, the Christians in the church and he's coming back for a faithful people and some of us have come into this habit of dismissing the church we found excuses because of this leader or that leader my brother my sister you're going to be held accountable for every word if you are sick and you you you, you have a physical need you go and you seek out a doctor now I, I tell you I am very disappointed by a lot of doctors I'm very encouraged by some because they are men and women of God and their work is is it's not a job it's a calling these are you know like the old time doctors that would hold your hand or speak to you or pick up the phone after they've treated you and say hey I treated you on such a day how are you doing that's virtually unheard of nowadays why money 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 and they try to fool themselves and say nobody um. many horror stories of doctors people that have been butchered by surgeons uh, people that have been neglected because of a late diagnosis or because of a misdiagnosis the tumors grown beyond being able to do much about ah, these are horror stories right as much as we appreciate those doctors many of them are, are, are man I tell you worldly money that's it they don't care for people we know that but if you're ill and you have an ill uh, an illness and a need and a physical need and you've been prayed for now we pray but we also go and look for attention doesn't mean because there's so many quacks out there that you're going to stop looking for medical attention just means that you've been to this quack you've identified him as being a charlatan uh, a, a, a money monger so you don't go see him but then you look for another one and if this one is a money a charlatan then you don't go see him you look for another one here's my thing if you have been hurt and disappointed by churches you do not have the right as a child of God to shut off all churches Jesus Christ himself this is his body you, if you have given up on church you need to repent of that you need to get back to the temple worship to the worship of the Christ's body towards him you need to be back in the life of the body again it's not pastor warren saying this is what jesus christ himself has ordained and if there yeah there are many false churches let me tell you i'm a pastor i see things and i'm disappointed and i'm discouraged disgusted by some of the things that i see happening in the name of jesus but listen that doesn't mean that i turn my back on the church of christ no because I see the other side as well I see faithful men and women who are living a faith walk man who, who, who although they're going through tough times they are still being generous to other people although they're going through things uh, tough circumstances they are still singing the high praises of God they, they still come together in prayer meetings and humbly hold hands together and worship their living God let us have a Hezekiah mentality let us get rid of all the nonsense in the storehouse of God uh, is, is, is all the things all the the idolatry perhaps mindsets or philosophy that we've let into our temple let's get rid of that stuff let's start impacting the church of Christ again let's get back into the house of God again my brother and my sister let's get back into unity again let's pray together let's seek God for his will let's worship him from a pure place and if your focus is on God most high no matter what Sennacherib comes your way, no matter what Sennacherib, you will always, let me tell you, you will always, always, always prevail. Why? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. May you be delivered. May you be encouraged. May you be uplifted. Above all, above all, if you're not, may you be rooted back into a local church or, or into a body that is caring for you nurturing you and discipling you it is so important let me pray for you oh heavenly father we love you 
And Lord, what a joy it is to look at these wonderful things in your word. What an inspiration Hezekiah is for us, Lord. What an inspiration this king. Despite all the negativity, despite the corruption, he stood up and made a stand. Father, I want to pray for all your sons and daughters out there to make a stand. Sometimes it's not easy to make a stand when you're being attacked by a Sennacherib. Oh God, but I want to pray that we would make a stand. That we would cut through all the the, the enemy's propaganda of false churches. We know how to discern between true and false. But oh God, for those that are not rooted in a church, Lord, that they would seek one out. Oh God, because this is your plan. Especially for these last days as we see the day drawing near. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints. God, would you give us wisdom in how to clear out the temple? Would you give us wisdom, Lord God? In, in how to reform the worship so that it will be pleasing. Oh, the Father seeks those that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Oh God, that's our heart, that we can worship You in spirit and in truth. But we cannot do this in our own flesh, by our own wisdom. We can only do this by Your Spirit. I pray You encourage, I pray You bless, I pray You lift the heads of Your people until we meet again next week. Amen and Amen. Brothers and sisters, even if I've never met you, please know I am praying for you and I speak tons of God's love and blessing your way. Bye-bye.